Lyndon Arthur is back, ready to stake a claim for a shot at world glory when he takes on Argentina's Walter Gabriel Shekiera. Part of a huge night of action on Saturday, September the 17th. It's live and free on Channel 5. This is Colin McGuigan for AFL TV, proudly sponsored by Everlast. I'm joined today by Jamie Conlon. Jamie, how's things? All good, Colin. How's things? All good, mate. Obviously, it's good to get you on. Um, we've a lot to talk about, actually, with yourself today, but I want to get straight to it. I seen hot off the press last night your tweet. Um, you're asking for the the wood rematch. Talk to me about that. I just thought it was a an ample opportunity to to put it out there that that uh, Lee's injury, if it knocked him out for a few weeks, they kind of pushed everything back. There's a logical step to come uh, and do Mick rematch. I I know how well it went down the zone. I know how much. Mick wants it obviously, and we want it, and we want it obviously more than Lee Wood, rightfully so, because he, because he's won the fight. So, and I know then, with the with the public perception of it, the public would would want the rematch. So, put it out there, see him get back. Spoke with Frank Smith late last night. I think they're still going to do Wood Laura, and the and extent of injury is is keeping him out maybe six weeks, seven weeks. So December is probably too soon for him to come back. But uh, it's always of interest to them and, and it's something that we'll, we'll kind of keep looking at going forward because you know, I think both fighters want to right wrongs. And both fighters think they can do better and do a better job. And uh, and I think the fight will always be there is, is what they're kind of banking on. But it won't be. It won't always be there. Talk to me about your initial thoughts when you hear Lee Wood has taken a fight of this magnitude against Lara? Initial thoughts was he doesn't have anyone with his best interests at heart around him. Um, i seen Ben Davison coming out and saying no easy fights. Your coach coming out and saying no easy fights doesn't sit right with me because your coach should be looking out for the best interests of the fighter. He should have the best interests at heart. He doesn't. He's either been told and, and persuaded that this is the right fight to take their better motors are um, his own ego, but this is not. It wasn't the right fit. Listen, I think, I think Laura. I understand decisions to kind of take Laura from a from a technical point of view. He's not great technically. He punches really hard. Wood has never been knocked down until he fought Michael. Um, he's not a big puncher, but and then they're saying so. Davison saying that and Lee, we got more money than than the common fit. To fit. This is what, that's idiotic, and that's what, what what I think he has people in his ear telling him to say it, and, and the kind of justify the decision making of taking Mauricio Lara is that he got more money for for Lara the, um, than he did for the previous fight against Michael Conlon. He should get more money to fight Lara. He should get more money than the previous fight because he won it. So your money always should go up and you have a, a, a better negotiation platform to kind of push yourself more. But I, I, that's why I think he just has bad advice. Listen to what they're coming out and saying, the reasoning for taking the fight. No easy fights. It's idiotic. Um, even at this stage, if they're going to go back in, they're not going to fight Mick, obviously, and they're going to go back in and fight Lara. It's idiotic because what was the whole point of fighting Lara? The point of fighting Lara was for keeping um, active before fighting Leo Santa Cruz or Vargas winner. Leo Santa Cruz and Vargas due to fighting what, November or whatever, or October, who fucking knows. But it then going to knock your, your unification world title that you're trying to wait and do if you're going to fight Laura and get potentially get done by Laura. Um, there's a lot of stuff that just doesn't make sense, decisions that don't make sense, but I just think that the boxer is getting abused here. Uh, and getting doesn't have someone looking out for his best interest. I know he's self managed now, so he be, he would be relying on a lot of the the advice from his coaches. Um, and they're they're thinking they're thinking with their their own egos here. Attack, just thinking they're we're taking big fights or tough fights, not big fights. Because if he beats Lara, he's in the same position if he beat Kiko Martinez or or Mick or anything like that. There, so. 
Why is that the smart move? Well, put yourself into the, the situation just for a second. I know you're not, that you're the manager of Lee Wood in this situation. Why should he fight Michael and not Lara? What's what's the benefit to Lee Wood from that situation to get that into, into the perspective of someone maybe that doesn't understand this? Number one, he knocked Michael out. You know, I mean, you can do a better job. I know he stated that he had a bad camp or something and, and that uh, he can do a better job. Mick and Lar or Mick and Wood generates a bigger gate, so they could have done it in in their football stadium or whatever. I know it's kind of past that time now because initially it was looking at August, and it fitted in with the agenda of doing it in football stadium. Um, so they would have generated a bigger crowd. He would have been able to fight in Nottingham Forest Stadium. You're not going to get Lee, or Lee Wood and Marisa Lar in that kind of um facility, so. That was another point. Mick and 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 uh, Wood generates a lot more money than uh, Lara and Wood. So his his point of view that he he learned more money than the previous fight uh, is quashed because he learned probably double that than he's getting from Michael. And I think uh, his profile, everything regarding it. Yes, Lara is a real ballsy move. And putting my position, or putting myself in his position as a fighter, you know, I just I have nothing but credit for Lee himself um, for taking that fight with Laura. But as management, I would think you have a better chance against Michael than you do against Laura, um, given the fact that they chinned him last time and it was so easy last time and their, their game plan worked last time and the, the shot that knocked him out that they worked on over and over again last time and you know, they put up that wee clip in the video. So, uh, there was a few points of that. Um, when I put myself in their position and what, why they and, and understand why, because I think Ben Davidson is very smart and on a on a boxing point of view and how he de- de- dissects fighters and well, sorry, I would say um, the other guy in the gym is is the one who does the, all the dissecting and he's the one who, who implements the game plan. Um, the kid, the guy from Newcastle, I forget his name. Lee um, Wiley. Ah, Lee, Lee Whaley. Uh, he's very, very smart and astute in terms of putting up a a, a game plan to beat a fighter. And they, when I looked at the fight and I spoke to a few people, I said, it's actually not, because I've seen the, the shout of Kovalev, uh, Nathan Cleverly choosing Kovalev in a, in a voluntary defence, being being batted around, and it did make sense. But I think maybe Laura, if you're looking at it off his last fight, is more a Mayorga like a Ricardo Mayorga figure where he's going to give you everything for three rounds and uh, four rounds and, and and then that's I think that's what they're banking on they think he's more a Mayorga than a Kovalev and um, yeah there is there is listen this is boxing man people make decisions all the time they kind of don't go against or go against the grain but uh, from my own standpoint I just think no one's really looking out for for the best interest of, of, of Lee Wood. I don't think he has enough people around him looking out for the right interest. I think ego is playing a big part in their decision-making process. Um, but he punches so hard that he can he can knock out uh, Risa Lara, and I, and I get that, and I understand that's why they think it's a 50-50 fight. Do you think it's plausible for me to suggest that if there was a an option to fight Michael in December, say, maybe January, that kind of time, you could do that and say possibly Belfast, and then there could be a setup for a trilogy fight in Nottingham Forest Stadium. Or is Lee, that is it beyond that now? I don't think Lee would ever want to come to Belfast. He didn't really want to do a press conference in Belfast. He's the champion now. He's 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 beat McNay. It was last time. It was a uh, mandatory, so he will be doing everything in, in his power. And I think Davidson also is is evasing is evasing him. So he would do everything in his power not to, to do anything in Belfast. It doesn't make any sense there because I think Lee in, in Nottingham is is a lot better than anywhere else when he's fighting. Um we need to be in a more powerful position to force that uh, to come to Belfast. Uh, and that's what we're trying to do. We're looking at all different avenues. We do have a plan in place for December for Michael. Um we're close to getting everything over the lane. This fight. Well, I thought I had possibility to do it, but obviously the injury is, is a lot worse than what we initially thought. So, I uh, um, yeah, it would be it would be a 
it would be brilliant to do in Belfast and have a kind of trilogy aspect of it, given the fact of what the first fight was like. Um, and then we go back to Ireland in the summer would be would be a great move if if we're being brutally honest from a promoter's point of view, but not from from a Lee Wood point of view. Coming here in St Paddy's Day or or February and then going back to if if he lost, but I think he would lose. Going back to Forest Stadium and doing the third fight, you know that would be. That would be my point of view, but not their team's point of view, of course. I do have to ask as well, obviously you've suggested that you think um, Lara would beat Lee Wood and you think that that's a, a high possibility. Where would Lee Wood go from that situation then next if Lara did beat Lee Wood? It's an interesting one. Um, yeah, obviously you have to look in-house initially for, for his point of view because they'll want to keep him in-house. They... They have Kiko, I think Kiko knocks out Jordan Gill. So maybe Kiko. Um, but I, I was speaking to Kiko saying I think he's only having one fight and then he's retiring. But that could pre- and I know Kiko accepted Lee and Laura before the last fight. So that's why they give they they fed Jordan Gill to him. Um because they owed him they owed him one back, I believe. Um I would say that. They don't have any featherweights in house. I don't think maybe Raymond Ford. They'll probably try and match him with Raymond Ford, someone like that to kind of get back in the rankings. I'd say that. No, Jazza Dickens maybe because it's an all British fight, and and Jazza beat him pretty pretty comfortably the first time. So yeah, I think something like that. You know, that's kind of another the risk and reward factor. You lose the make you do another fight with make. When you were saying initially, if you were Lee Wood's manager, you're guaranteed two big paydays. Literally guaranteed, given the given the the magnitude of the first fight with Megan and how well received around the world, not just in the UK and Ireland, around the world. I know the zone were very very interested and wanted to do the the rematch, but you could have positioned yourself to go two big big paydays. Um, and he has a good chance of beating Megan. Better chance probably than beating Megan than he did against Marisa La- or sorry, Lara. Um, so yeah. So if he beats Laura, you go, okay, he's in the same position as he if he didn't fit Laura. But if he beats him, your ego, and you can walk about with your big swinging dick, thinking that you're top coach and top fighter and all that there shit. And that's kind of I think. And then from the, the coaches and manager or Vaza point of view, if he loses to Laura, we took a massive risk. Man. We took a big risk. We took a hang. We went against it. We dared to be great. Oh, there are balls. And that's what I think that's, that's why they... They choose Laura. Before we move on from this Lee Wood talk, I do need to clarify something. It was a long time ago, obviously, in the, the press conference, you did mention about some sort of um, back and forth with Ben Davis, and you said that potentially, you know, he was, he's lied to you once, you'll never believe another word comes out of his mouth. Can you go a bit further on that for us? Listen, I'm not in the opposite corner. When, when I'm in the opposite corner, I'll be in that main set, but I, I Listen, I think Ben Davis is a very, very good coach. I know I've just spent about 10 minutes there saying he's making a wrong move and it's all on ego and stuff. But I, I, I still have a lot of time for him. I do listen to him. And and you always be wary of why, you know, a fight is being made if he's involved in. But if we're in the opposite corner, then we have a different mindset towards everyone who's in the other corners. And, and, and again, that's why. But we were in the same change room for... Fury against uh, Dillian White, and you know we 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 talked about there and shook hands and whatever, and you know they put it all behind us, and I, I still keep it behind us. I still wish them success and Laura when when the fight was done, when the when the agreement was made for Santa Cruz to fight Lee, I was I was pleased for them because they deserved it, given the the toughness of the previous fight. Taking Laura, you know you get props from me as a fan and and me as a fighter, but. From a management point of view, I just see no sense in it, um, and I just think it's it's one way to be in a you know a sore head. But saying that, I have no, I have no grape, no grape. Yourself and Mick have both been vocal in that if this wood fight doesn't happen, it'll be business as usual. You'll move on. So, with that in mind, who and when is next for Michael? Uh, there's a few names been thrown around. We're looking at December 10th. Um, we have provisionally booked December 3rd, December 10th um, in Belfast 
Fury and White Knight knocks the December 3rd, or Fury and AJ, sorry, knocks the December 3rd date off. We have December 10th. We're just trying to tie in with broadcasters and see if everything works there. And then we'll start to move forward with a few different names uh, we're looking at um, with the WBA and WBO just to kind of move in positions. If we can't fight for the World Title next, which I don't presume because I think Navarati is still um, on the side of what's his next move is. Um, and we're looking at one or two options there with the BO and one or two options there with the BA about, about getting him in position in the fight for World Title as soon as possible. We want to make a you know, my goal is, is Michael's brother, manager, whatever you want to call it, is to just make him world champion. If you can get world champion, financially secure and be world champion, that's the job is done. Uh, Mick has massive aspects or massive aspirations to still achieve. And, you know, with Lee Wood, it became more personal than anything because he, he inflicted a defeat and, and that's that was it. But I'd say that, I have no real, no real hang about it. If we're we're talking about condom boxing shows, is that going to be the next condom boxing show then in December? We're looking at a show. We have been looking at a show on October twenty second in Galway. Where it's it's unlikely. Uh, it was a new venture going down the Galway, and I don't think we'll get it over the lane in time before October. But we have booked dates in January for Kimber Lloyd down there. We have booked dates in in before the end of the year. We're looking at different dates as well. So. Plus our main event, um, most likely will move now to a different. Uh, we have a do an agreement in place, an agreement in principle with with Mrs. Sarland that we've took for for Paddy McCrory now to take a a bigger fight in Germany. So we've lost the main event um, for TV. Um, Paddy's now he's got a great fight and a great opportunity now in Germany with with uh, Sarland promotions um, or Wasserman now they are so. Um, excited for that and um, I, I think we may be able to get the two lads on the undercard there as well to keep them busy and keep them active um, we also have dates booked penciled at the end of uh, October but if we get the lads all out there that's that's where we'll go we'll go to Germany with the guys and can you give us a bit more information on that that fight in Germany who it's against what it's for I think we're going to be I think it's going to be announced this week but it, uh, no, I don't think I don't think we're allowed to say anything till till the end. So now I don't like doing that on the promoter. So, ah, but we've he's took a big opportunity against an unbeaten German fighter in Germany, um, and for a title for a big title. So, I'm glad and very happy the party. Um, he's getting these opportunities now. He came through a real hard scene where he was actually having to pay for shows at the very start. You know, he was you know really really the bottom of the ladder. He built up his own kind of fan base himself. He started to generate momentum, playing on a football team. So a football, he had that atmosphere of the team coming out, watching him after a Saturday, sold his own tickets on real kind of dinner shows and so on and so forth. And it's gradually built into a headline act. If he wins his fight, we'll come back to, uh, come back with party, potentially depending on, on the team and on the, on the, on the card on, in December. But if it doesn't suit, we can do party in a in a in a big big fight in the arena maybe, um, early next year. When you when you said the two lads on the undercard, are you referring to Kieran Malloy and Kurt Walker in that instance? I should have clarified that. Yes, Kieran Malloy and Kurt Walker, top rank, um, top rank guys. Most likely we 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 have two spaces are on the undercard. I think we can get them on that. If not, we'll look to get them out uh, in October, summer in the UK potentially in the US as well so um, yeah we're looking at all the different options there and they, uh, we were all set for October 22nd it would work well to just slot them in on a different card in October 22nd but they were all they were in camp for a show on October 22nd um, just unforeseen different wee things could certainly add up will go away that it's 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 getting too close to kind of make a move on it so I uh, usually like to have 8 to 10 weeks before you announce a show and Kind of, we're getting, we're getting, um, pa we're way past that now, but we're getting it just doesn't make sense. What about Tyrone McKenna and Lewis Crocker? Have we got anything upcoming for, for them at the moment? The crack, I think he needs to get a six rounder or an eight rounder under his belt. He's been training away in, in uh, in Surrey with Adam Booth. It's all new to him, everything is new. He was due to make a his first fight with Adam, his debut with Adam, 
um, on mixed card there in August, but he picked up an injury on six or seven days out. He just had a rib injury and it wasn't going to heal in time. He's given plenty of time to heal now. We'll look at getting him out. New field, new team around him. Everything is uh, all new, so we kind of steadily bring it back in. Given the fact that he hadn't been able to defend his W European title, he had to relinquish that. Um, I think Liam Taylor's going to fight for that next week, or in two weeks. Um, that kind of set that back. But again, it's a process with Crack. We're going to do either 6th or 8th in October, again in December, maybe an 8th or a 10th, and then I think we're looking at uh, a show with the Crack headline in early next year in Belfast. Um, that's the plan with him. Tyrone, we're hoping for a big fight on Mixon the Crack. I think he's been very, very vocal. Florian Marku is, is the fight that Tom McKenna wants. I think uh, both sides make sense. Tyrone McKenna is not a big welterweight. Florian Marku, I think, struggles with big welterweights because he's pretty small for welterweight himself. And um, it'll, be a, a, it'll be a firecracker, humdinger. Both of them will stand in the ring and, and just, just go hell for leather. I think Tyrone, you know, He's in the twilight stage of his career. We've kind of put a plan in place what, what to do for the for the remainder of the career. And fights like Florian Marcus is what's, what's going to excite him. Only fights that excite him is the only fight he's going to take. I, I do need to obviously ask your opinion on, first of all, AJ Fury. Do you think it happens? I, I'm very surprised the speed that's moving. Um, a fight of this magnitude usually... Is a is a process of months. Uh, obviously, I seen Hearn saying that he hasn't received the contract yet. That will be a, a slight delay in the process because of lawyers. Lawyers want money, so they will want to review contracts for as long as possible. I know. I th- listen, this all comes down to the power and power of both fighters. If this was any other fight, uh, say Crawford Spence or something like that, where the fighters didn't have as much say sway. Um, say or sway in the fight then it doesn't happen as fast but with with Fury and AJ they can tell the, they can, can dictate the promoter to the broadcasters to the venues what they want to do and that seems to be what's happening I think it's the only time it can happen if I'm being brutally honest because you just don't know what do you do with AJ next if he fights in Otto Wallen if he fights uh, a white again I don't think he looks as good or whatever to kind of warrant another fight with with Fury. I think he improved a lot from the the second or from the first Usyk fight to the second Usyk fight. He's taken confidence in that that he's been able to mix it with one of the most unpredictable fighters in the division. Or sorry, Fury is one of the most unpredictable fighters, in the, unconventional fighters in the division. Um, with Usyk, kind of what he does, he doesn't fight like a heavyweight, and all the different factors fighting the southpaw, etc. I think he's get take confidence from the previous camp and not that he'd done a lot better than the first camp. Does he bring that in to this camp? I don't know. Fury, man, is, is an enigma. He's yet to be found out. I think he's always been one step ahead of AJ. AJ is a bit more robotic and they're trying to add a bit of fluidity, fluidity to him and, and give him a bit of different factor. But in seeing that it's moving at this speed, this speed the the... Sound bites that you're getting from all camps seem like it's very, very positive and it is going to happen. I'm very skeptical that anything happens at this at, at that speed. But again, it's the fighters that they're the ones calling the shots here. They're the ones in the driving seat. AJ seems like he wants it. Fury seems like he wants it. So I think it can happen. What about you, Bank Ben? We've seen this week Senior come out and say that he doesn't want Eubank to fight at that weight. Do you think that's maybe just a ploy to get it to 160, maybe remove the rehydration clause? What do you think? I think the re- rehydration clause is the, is, the, is, the, is the point that they're all trying to get out of the way. The weight itself, I don't think, is an issue. Um, I think Eubank can get down to 160. The rehydration clause is, is the issue from him, personally, because of what he does after the weigh-in, how much he blown, blows up and, and becomes a different fighter on the, than he was on the scales. Um, 
And from what I'm hearing, I don't know what is true or not in terms of what the rehydration clause is. I don't think it's ever been truly disclosed, which is worrying because the IBF have a 10 pound rehydration clause and they said it's below that. And it most likely they'll have a, a time, uh, time delay or time stipulated that, stipulated that usually with the IBF, it's like eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning. But I think it's probably later on in the day time to, 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 to factor in that Ben is moving up three weights or whatever um, to take the fight. If that is the case, uh, yeah, I can see the ploy by you, you being senior, man. I, I love him. Like, I think he's he's um, TV gold, like he's class. Having, having senior involved where he wasn't involved, now next thing he appears out of the blue and throws this banner and it works and makes everyone kind of go, fuck, what's going on? That's, you know, that's that's classic Eubank, isn't it? So the only the only difference is it isn't just your average opponent. Ben or Connor Ben has his dad to rely on, who's been through all this shit previously for the past amount of years that he's that that the uh, Eubank senior's thrown at him. He can rely on him for advice and, and and speak to him regarding what's the best way to handle things. Finally, before I, I let you go, because I know you're very busy today, Triple G Canelo this week. What's your thoughts? How does it go? In Canelo, I think Canelo, yes, definitely. But I think Canelo can maybe even get a stoppage, just given the fact uh, how Triple G looked in the last fight, how he uh, has aged. He's 40 now, isn't he? Um, I would never have said anyone could stop Triple G, but I think at this moment in time, I think Canelo could potentially stop him. Um, just because he was taking a lot of punishment um, in the last fight, in the previous fight, that he usually doesn't really show any factors of it, but I think he did, and he's starting to show a bit of wear and tear. He ended up getting the job done, obviously, but Canelo's a different animal. And he's constantly improving. Okay. It's insane that you come off a loss, and that's kind of a testament to Canelo and Faders and her the, pers- the the perspective of 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 Faders losing, you know, is you know, can change with the fader. He jumps out of one fight losing and fighting Can and, Tri- and Triple G in the next fight, and no one's bad an eyelid. I don't think he, anyone's really discussing that he did lose the bevel, and. It was obviously it was a step too far, and he got hurt a few times, and he was just a bigger guy. But it, it's it's what you like to see. Faders lose, your faders take opportunities, and they lose, and they come back. And um, when you're Canelo, you can change. You can change how boxing is is, is looked at. Well, Jamie, thanks a million for joining me today. We'll do this again very soon. Really, really appreciate it, man. Cheers, Calm, and shave up mustache. <laughs> I knew you were going to slag me at the end of this. Cheers. Yeah, my dad in the street against a heavyweight. I've gone back to the dad. I've punched him a few more times. My bloke's outside my front door. You coming out? One hell of a fucking story. So stay tuned.